<clears throat> My name is Natalia gomez Ospina. I'm assistant professor in pediatrics, and I will be moderating this MCSR, MCHRI session. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, three esteemed speakers who are experts in the field of dermatology and biomedical data sciences. Our first speaker is Dr. Jing Tang. She's a physician scientist, a professor of dermatology, and she specializes in genetic diseases. Uh, I know about basal cell nevus syndrome and ep epidermolysis bullosa, um, um, but there are other diseases she works on. Um, her work is primarily centered on finding new ways to treat and prevent those diseases um, and studying the genetic factors involved in uh, skin cancers, uh, particularly melanoma. Um, our next speaker is Orsana Denishu, is also a physician scientist. She's a clinical scholar in dermatology and a postdoctoral scholar in biomedical data sciences. She's past passionate about integrating cutting-edge technology, cutting technologies such as genomics and machine learning with clinical medicine to improve patient outcomes. Um, and um, our third speaker is Dr. Eleni Linos, um, who's a professor of dermatology and epidemiology at Stanford University. She's a renowned expert in the field of dermatology, and her work is focused on using technology to improve uh, public health, cancer prevention, and the care of older adults. Um, it is an honor to have such a distinguished speaker, uh, speaker sharing with us with their, with their expertise today. And uh, I wanted to briefly um, uh, thank the MS MCHRI Educational Committee for organizing our monthly uh, seminars, as well as our, our year uh, MCHRI Symposium, which, uh, next slide. Uh, oh, our next, sorry back <laughs> our next uh seminar is not going to be in a month it's going to be very soon may 2nd and we're going to be discussing iron deficiency deficiency anemia in pregnancy um so please stay tuned um and please save the date for the the annual uh stanford mchri symposium it is october october uh 19th uh on thursday uh, and there will be uh, great sessions for us to learn about maternal child health uh, uh, research. In. And finally, I um, uh, wanted to mention the Stanford Medicine Innovation Office Hours with um, uh, Grant Wells to discuss any projects that relate to innovation or development around uh, childhood and maternal health. Uh, if you need feedback uh, or ideas about how to move your projects forward, um, this is a great resource. And welcome to our speakers, and we're delighted to have you. Thank you so much, Natalia, for this uh, um, great intro. Thanks uh, for all the uh, attendees. I see Harvey. I haven't seen him in years, and he was there when the new um, LPCH hospital was uh, being opened up. And I'd like to thank MCHRI for all their support, the CDCM for all their support. We couldn't have uh, treated so many EB patients um, without uh, all of their help. And we really, really just thank you from the bottom of our hearts um, for all your collaboration and your partnership in this. I'm really excited um, to give this talk. I will speak first about the disease, about the importance of remote skin monitoring. I'll then pass the baton on to my colleague, Dr. Alina Eleni Linos, who has um, developed an improved technology for skin monitoring. And then finally, we're going to pass it to another assistant professor, Roxana um, Danishu, who will really give you the future in terms of uh, where this is going. We picked um, a special disease called epidermal lysis bullosa because it is near and dear to our hearts. It is one of the worst diseases you can imagine in dermatology. Um, Stanford is an incredible um, multidisciplinary um, center uh, for the study and treatment of epidermal lysis bullosa. Uh, what is EB, epidermal lysis bullosa? It is a rare genetic disease, and this is a newborn that was born in LPCH hospital. You might call Joyce Tang, Feng Ku, um, any one of our excellent pediatric dermatologists. And a lot of these patients are airlifted and transfer, transferred uh, to LPCH because we provide incredible care and specialized care in terms of our, um, especially our wound nurses. This is a rare genetic disease, one in 500,000 
these patients um, inherit um, mutations in collagen 7A1. This is a gene that encodes a protein called type 7 collagen. And this protein is important for the formation of anchoring fibrils. Anchoring fibrils are kind of like staples. They hold the keratinocyte to the fibroblast. And like staples, they hold on the top layer to the medium bottom layer of your skin. Without those stables, staples, any shearing, any force causes your epidermis to be really weak and fragile. And because the epidermis shears, you form blisters underneath, the blisters pop, you develop wounds that leads to a lot of pain, itch, frequent infections, uh, because there's so many wounds that leads the patient to have anemia. The wounds are sites for chronic inflammation. So the patients often develop aggressive squamous cell carcinoma, SCCs, early death. There's no treatment for it, but the standard of care is wound dressings uh, that are non-adhesive, not your standard band-aids, because even band-aids alone will tear the skin. Uh, they get chronic topical and oral antibiotics. Um, and the real goal for now is to heal these large chronic open wounds by restoring this missing and dysfunctional type seven collagen. The figures I'm showing you on the right-hand side show now a uh, toddler with um, these blisters and these wounds. We might call these recurrent wounds. These wounds may happen here, they may close up, but then another blister happens and now there's a new wound here. It might heal, but then some other area of skin is traumatized. Over time, the wounds, because they occur so frequently, especially on extremities like the arms and the legs where kids you know, run around and get injured, um, the recurrent wounds eventually don't heal and they may become chronic wounds that never heal. And this is one of our LPCH patients who, you know, unfortunately, this is the standard of care. They're constantly uh, dressed in uh, bandages and, um, and, um, and basically this is the way that, you know, patients and their caregivers uh, try to protect their skin. So I wanted to tell you about a gene therapy trial. Uh, this is a science that was developed at Stanford, and it's taken about 20 years for us to develop this. And what are we doing here? We are biopsying using two small punch biopsies, non-wounded skin from an EB patient. Um, and these uh, biopsies um, were then used to collect the top layer, the keratinocytes grown in a cell culture dish. And then we used a retrovirus containing the full length 9KB collagen um, 7A1 gene. And we used the retrovirus to insert uh, the wild type gene, grow up the epidermal keratinocytes. And we make these gene therapy skin grafts and these two punch biopsies basically generate uh, six uh, of these um, gene therapy uh, sheets. And they're fixed on gauze just because these uh, epidermal sheets are so fragile, right? So the gauze really helps us be able to carry it. These were first um, grown in a little um, sterile bubble room um, in the um, stem cell uh, uh, building on campus next to CCSR. Then we transferred the technology to the GMP facility on California Avenue. And then we entered a collaboration and partnership where um, a public company called Abiona uh, took over and out licensed this technology. And now um, the gene therapy skin grafts are produced by Abiona in their GMP facility in Cleveland. So we did the phase one, two trial at Stanford with seven patients. We showed safety and positive results. And what I'm showing you now are the results of the completed, recently completed phase three trial where we treated 11 uh, recessive dystrophic EB patients. So what happens? We biopsy the patient, we send um, the biopsy to Abiona Cleveland. In about 25, 26 days, they grow out enough of these uh, um, gene therapy graphs at 11 a.m. Uh, Cleveland, uh, a flight arrives, um, United Airlines direct flight at SFO. They hand carry the graphs 
uh, to the OR, and the OR usually starts um, the surgery around 2 p.m., and our wonderful plastic surgery, pediatric plastic surgeon colleagues, uh, Dr. Um, Peter Lorenz, Dr. Uh, Rohit Kosla, Dr. Um, uh, Brudman and our wonderful anesthesiologist, Luis Furukawa, especially. It's a whole team that we schedule and we debride the wound uh, because these wounds aren't perfectly three by uh, five by three, uh, five by seven centimeters uh, size. We debride the chronic wound. And here you see the plastic surgeon and their team using sutures to sew on the gene therapy skin grafts onto these wounds. Uh, because these skin grafts are fragile, uh, the patient stays uh, for seven days as an inpatient in the LPCH CDCM uh, room on the fifth floor. And our patients stay there. The wonderful nurses help um, assist them. So they minimize friction, they minimize trauma. So the gene therapy skin grafts will take. So this is a, a typical patient with recessive dystrophic EB. You can see they have multiple wounds. And so within each patient, we can randomize certain wounds to receive the EB101. That's what the product is called, the EB101 gene therapy graft, or the control, which is the untreated wound. On this right-hand side where you can see my cursor, this is um, a published um, result from our JAMA article where you see as an outline the debrided wound on a patient's hand at baseline. And then after gene therapy EB101 graft application at three months, six months, and 12 months, and you see nice wound healing. Obviously, the skin does not look like you know non-EB skin, but at least the wound is closed. The wound is not painful. It's not itchy. And then on serial biopsies, we're able to show functional restoration of the collagen seven, the protein product. So I want you to focus on this green line. The green line is the expression of the type seven collagen protein that is now on the linear uh, basement membrane zone uh, where it should be. And you can see this green line is certainly not present um, uh, at baseline. So this basically shows you that we see nice wound healing and it's associated with now the new uh, protein product of collagen seven. These are results uh, from the completed phase three trial. And you can see this large wound uh, on this EB patient's thigh. At, in the OR, uh, the surgeons debrided the large wound and they could fit three of these EB101 gene therapy grafts. And then at the end of the week 24 or six month um, study visit, you can see how nice the gene therapy grafts are in terms of wound healing. How do we know they are there? Because within the OR, we actually tattoo, you can see these little dots, tattoo the corners of where the gene therapy graphs are placed so we can go back and measure um, the uh, wound healing. We negotiated with the FDA for a long time um, about how much wound healing it takes. So we set thresholds and endpoints of 50%, 75% complete wound healing, you know, whether there's pain reduction and itch reduction. But you know what was really annoying? I've told you so much about how hard it is for these patients to travel, how delicate and fragile their skin is, the FDA still requires inpatient assessments. So, so many of these patients fly in from Texas, from Colorado, from wherever, and they have to fly in repeated times just so we can assess their skin. This can be easily done um, on serial skin uh, photos. Uh, questions like how painful is it, your wound, how itchy is it, that could also be assessed remotely as well. This is another example, just to show you a different kind of wound. This is a woman's uh, back where they had uh, wounds on her upper shoulder and her trunk. And uh, at the day of grafting, you debride uh, the wounds, you sew on the grafts. And then on week 26, because of the tattoos, we can identify where the grafts were placed. And in these particular grafts, the photos clearly show we see near 100% wound healing with minimal pain and minimal itch. So because the FDA even issued guidance saying, gosh, these patients are so fragile, even traveling, you know, jeopardizes their skin, you know, 
investigators should try their best to minimize traveling, right? Clinical trials are so archaic. They require patients to travel into the sites and all this stuff. We said there's a real important role for remote skin monitoring. So we used a um, an app called um, Tissue Analytics. And in this app, uh, we trained patients. Nikki Harris is on this line. She trained 13 patients on how to use the app. Uh, the patients identify a couple of target wounds um, and basically put a ruler um, with a green dot uh, next to the target wound. They take a photograph every week for six months. And uh, within the app, you can answer, you know, what's the wound pain on that day? What's the itch pain on that day? And then they can see the baseline photo and basically track it over time. So this is a, a, a real example of one of our photos uh, from a patient where you can see this large geographic wound on her back. And it shows her, you know, where that target wound was and all the photos she took in March and April. And we designed a study, an observational cohort study, where we train patients uh, to use this um, tissue analytics app. And they uploaded photos every week. And we observed for spontaneous wound closure. Well, why is that important? Um, it's really important because over time, we observe that there are two different kinds of wounds. We observe that these patients have one type, which is chronic open wounds. And this blue line actually shows you we gave enough photos of EB wounds uh, for the mobile um, app to actually use machine learning to accurately trace the edges of the wounds. And when Nikki went back and, and, and double checked the, the wound tracings, if there were errors, you know, she could correct the machine learning tracing and retrace it. The point is for these chronic open wounds, if we followed them for up to six months, we really didn't see any spontaneous wound closure on standard of care dressings, um, topical ointments, uh, oral antibiotics. So the take home message is this kind of wound, chronic open wounds, never spontaneously close. In contrast, the bottom panel shows you the recurrent wound types. You know, these are usually smaller. They may not have been present for very long, but you can see by month two, we start seeing some wound closure, but month, by month four, you start seeing the wounds opening up again. So these wounds may close spontaneously, but then open up again. And why is this important? because the natural history of these types of wounds are very, very different, right? And most of these clinical trial endpoints, whether you're testing gene therapy or a topical cream or something else, they require as an endpoint percentage of wounds or how many wounds actually close, right? So you can imagine if somebody's designing a clinical trial, if you enroll a bunch of chronic open wounds on standard of care compared to your drug, you know, very few people would have um, you know, spontaneous closure. But if you accidentally don't know these different types and you roll a bunch of recurrent wounds, even if your drug has no effect, maybe a bunch of recurrent wounds might spontaneously close because that's their type. They're different from these chronic open wounds. So that's a huge, huge challenge in these rare diseases, right? We're not talking about diabetic foot ulcer wounds. We're not talking about common sacral ulcer wounds, right? Where you have a lot of um, data on. It's quite common. There's FDA guidance. But as we each, if you work in rare disease, you have to deal with the problem of very little data um, on natural history studies um, in these rare diseases. So there was no prior knowledge of these different distinct wound types in EB. Um, and um, one of the best sources is just from the patients themselves, right? So I'm showing you a graph on this right-hand side where this other company called uh, Scioderm uh, conducted the largest uh, uh, clinical trial in EB, and it was 150 patients. And as you can see, the blue line is right on top of the gray line. The blue line is their drug, and the gray line is the placebo. And they follow these target wounds for up to three months, and they saw that the proportion of target wounds with wound closure was about 50%, and there was no difference in the drug and the placebo. So, you know, part of the problem was they compared apples and oranges. They didn't know about these different types of wounds. 
And so when we did this natural history study, what we found in these Kaplan-Meier curves, where this axis shows the percent of wound closure probability, the recurrent wounds really, you know, 50% of them may close up in a matter of, you know, a few weeks. In contrast, very few, 10 to 20% of chronic open wound types uh, would even close up. So this tells us that whether the EB patient, you're enrolling a target wound, whether it's the recurrent type or the chronic open type, it is critical to know uh, when you're designing a clinical trial and testing an agent. And so, you know, the sample size can be reduced, the follow-up time can be reduced, and most importantly, we think that remote skin monitoring is here so you can minimize patient travel um, to uh, clinical trial sites. What I'm really, really excited about is uh, work that's now being conducted by three postdocs, uh, Dr. Vaishali Mattel, Dr. Piru Pathmaraha, and Dr. Edward Aid. I'm not going to show any of this data today, but we're collaborating with the EB uh, Patient Foundation, EBRP, and um, Amazon Web Services Cloud, and we're developing an online patient registry because now we know we can collect uh, clinical data remotely. We use REDCap for in, you know, remote online consenting. Uh, we're able to do home genetic testing where we send them a, uh, a buccal swab kit and they do a buccal swab. They send it to GeneDx and we get you know, accurate, good DNA yields. We can you know, use exome sequencing or GeneDx does exome sequencing and we can identify the genetic mutation the patient can upload their wound data. They can upload their, you know, PRO, patient reported outcome of pain and itch. And basically we can replace, you know, a clinical trial and a site and we can collect all this rich data now uh, from the patient's home and collect it on a website where hopefully we can share back with the patient and engage the patient um, to participate more in research and, and really, you know, share the knowledge we have um, with these patients. So that's the last of my slides, and I'm going to hand over it uh, to my colleague, Dr. Linos. Hi, um, everyone, and thank you, Jean. I always get inspired when I hear you talk about patients with EB, and um, like you said at the beginning, this is an example disease, um, but it's such a striking one because I think if we can have an impact you know, with the amazing discoveries you and Dr. Orr are making, you can really transform um, a whole family's life, not just the, the kids. And um, the other thing I wanted to mention before I share my slides is that I, I feel like this is this talk um, highlights the amazing power of being at Stanford and collaboration, because Jean has just told you, and, and translational science and team science, because Jean has just told you all of the incredible work they're doing in EB. And then what I'm going to describe is um, a parallel set of work uh, that was happening it related to monitoring skin disease from home um, that started off as unrelated, but has kind of converged now to, to solve a common problem. So, so with that, I will share my screen. Um, and thank you again to MCHRI for um, having us and for all your support. Can you see this okay now? You can see it, Jean. Okay. Yes. Do you see? Um, do you guys see screen view with the notes or no? Do you no, see... just the full screen. The full screen. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, so thank you to MCHR for having us and also for all of the support through the biostatistical um, office hours. Our our team has really benefited for that, so we're very grateful. And I have no conflicts of interest. So our work was really focused on how do we use um, digital technology to monitor skin disease in the era of uh, COVID-19 transforming the use of telemedicine. So these are this graph shows how patients were seen, you know, uh, in each month in dermatology in 2018, 19. As you can see, the vast majority were were seen in person, and on the y-axis is the percent of visits. Uh, through telemedicine, which March 2020 skyrocketed and is now stabilized at about between 15 and 20 percent. At the same time, um, you know, we realize that skin disease is incredibly common. So 2 billion people, 25 percent of Americans have a skin disease. 
Um, and 64% of dermatology visits are for chronic skin conditions. So conditions that, you know, you need to repeatedly see a patient for. And at the same time, you know, 6.6 .6 billion people have a smartphone. 85% of Americans uh, have access to a smartphone at home and 87 million use a health or fitness app uh, for monitoring or tracking their health. And so this is a unique opportunity, both coming at a unique time um, and because of the technological innovations that allow us to do that. Now, what's the problem in dermatology with seeing a patient in clinic in person? Part of it is what Jean mentioned for these patients with rare diseases, it's very difficult to travel for older adults um, that, you know, our team was very interested in. Sometimes it's very difficult to travel. So mobility is a huge barrier. But the other barrier is that you often don't see the patient um, as a dermatologist when you need to see them. So this is a graph of a skin disease that varies or fluctuates over time. And an EB wound may be an example of that, as Jean just showed you, these wounds open and they close again. Uh, but many other diseases have this problem, psoriasis, eczema, they get worse and they get better uh, over time. However, your dermatology visits happen at these standard intervals and often may not capture the trajectory of the disease. So you may only see your doctor uh, at a time when really your skin is not what you want them to see. So that's why we, uh, with feedback from patients, providers, and the design company IDEO, developed this tool we call uh, DORA, which is a tool to monitor uh, skin diseases from home. And the idea is you can capture photos and symptoms um, and encourage patients to submit serial photos over time in order to capture this variations. And what are some of the advantages of this approach compared to the traditional clinic visit? Easy to use, you can do it from home, which reduces barriers of transportation, travel, mobility. Um, it can help you monitor lesions that change over time like EB wounds and can be automated um, and therefore scalable. So I'm gonna show you some photos. This was a, one of our first photos collected with Dora that was you know, worrying because you see black pigment on the toe and you know, as dermatologists, melanoma is the first thing we always worry about. Uh, but of course, other things can happen on toes. And by having a weekly photo, you can see that this thing resolved. It was just a... a collection of blood from trauma and very, very reassuring to see the transition of it. Um, in our pilot studies, we looked at other diseases. We looked at vitiligo, we looked at um, folliculitis, we looked at eczema, trying to get a sense of how feasible it is for patients to send photos from home and what some of the limitations are. Uh, we also, you know, we're speaking at MCHRI, we are also collecting photos of infants uh, with infantile hemangioma, which poses different challenges from taking photos from adults. Um, and really one of our goals and one of the uh, projects we're working on now, funded by uh, the NIH, is to generalize uh, the use of DORA, so the, the use um, of this image collection and symptom collection system, uh, across all ages and skin tones. And Roxana will uh, speak a little bit about uh, the importance of diversity in skin image tones later on. Um, in order to monitor skin conditions from home and assess symptom severity, um, develop a longitudinal image library of skin diseases from diverse skin tones. So here are some examples. We've been collecting, uh, again, preliminary data since September. We've used it for eczema, uh, rosacea, hydradenitis superativa, infantile hemangiomas, and now epidermolysis bullosa. We're collecting images sequentially over time. And these, are, these images are collected through automated text reminders. So the patient signs up and consents to receive the text reminders that come at the frequency that the investigator wants to send them at. So for some diseases, it might be once a week. For other diseases, it might be once a month. Um, and they're accompanied with a specific questionnaire that includes demographics, symptoms, uh, pain scores, quality of life measures tailored to the disease. So 
the survey that a patient with EB, for example, might get is going to be different than a patient with eczema might get. Um, and so far, you know, here are some of the, the numbers of patients we've enrolled in photos uploaded. Um, uh, for hydradenitis superativa, for example, we have about 400 photos from 28 patients. Um, for infantile hemangioma, we've recruited 20 patients and have almost 200 photos. And this co data collection is ongoing. I'm going to show you some example photos, and I apologize in advance for the, the squeamish people that don't love skin disease. Um, uh, us dermatologists do tend to, to love it. But here's an example of um, some photos of hydradenitis. Hydradenitis is another very severe, painful disease that occurs in, in skin folds. So it can occur in the groin and the armpit. And um, the reason this is interesting is not only because it's a disease that significantly affects quality of life, um, tends to occur more often in women and women of color specifically, but also from the methodologic standpoint, it's interesting because the photo quality you can get from folds and angulated areas um, is, is a kind of methodologic problem we need to solve for. Um, and here it is, um, graphed photos graphed with symptoms and pain scores. So just to give you an idea, idea of the type of data we can collect and track. As I mentioned, it's important to note that folds are um, difficult to photograph. Lighting is important. And I know Roxana in her next segment is going to talk a little bit about how they're resolving that. Other challenges um, we noticed are you know, patients sending us photos with makeup, for us not to be able to assess the disease or wearing glasses or other things. Um, more example photos, this is a patient with rosacea tracked over time. Um, again, combining photos with quality of life is one of our key goals. Um, and um, here are some photos of, of infants. Here, one interesting learning point we found was that the timing with uh, at which we send the reminders uh, the text message reminders really mattered by the disease type. For example, patients with rosacea, which is a disease of the face, would essentially respond to our reminders regardless of what time of day we sent the text reminder. But patients um, who are parents of infants or patients with HS where you know, the area is in a more private location could only really respond if they were in a private location. So we had to shift the timing of our automated reminders to match, um, to match the disease. Um, and right now, you know, this is our, our R01 that we're working on, as I mentioned, to try and develop a longitudinal image library uh, of skin disease in older adults. Again, very much focused on diverse skin tones. Um, and briefly, I want to touch upon uh, how this collaboration came to be and the upcoming projects that we've just started in collaboration with Jean Tang and Tony Oro. So the idea is to um, be able to use our tool to facilitate longitudinal monitoring of these wounds for Jean and Tony's um, patient recruitment and engagement. And we've just started recruiting. We have five patients enrolled. Um, I think two adults and three children, and we're collecting um, images and quality of life and pain. Here are some photos of the, uh, the very first few patients recruited. Um, and we're about to launch um, to recruit um, nationally as well. Um, and uh, our hope is to recruit patients really from, from across the country with this disease. And with this, I'd like to thank you know, again, MCHRI has been instrumental in helping us develop the methods um, uh, for these projects, as well as Stanford uh, Amy Center that gave us the initial seed funding for this project, and of course, the, the NIH. So maybe I'll stop there, and Roxana can share her, her slides. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for having me here today, along with my colleagues, uh, Dr. Tang and Dr. Linos. Today, I'll be talking about 
how we leverage artificial intelligence to improve clinical workflows. And you'll see it's very relevant to the prior two talks. Um, my work in general looks at how we can leverage image-based AI, text-based AI. I'm sure everybody's heard about chat GPT at this point um, into our clinical workflows. I'll be focusing specifically on one thing that we have built and are uh, getting ready to deploy within the Stanford healthcare system. Um, but I have a lot of different projects that I work on in the AI uh, space um, as relevant to healthcare applications. So today I'll be talking about True Image, um, which is all about getting better clinical photos for telemedicine. And these are my disclosures. None of them are relevant to this talk, except that we do have a pending patent um, on what I'm discussing today. So I think, you know, not to rehash what was kind of already mentioned before too much, but essentially COVID-19 pandemic led to this overnight increase in the use of telemedicine. And one thing that we realized very quickly is that even though we live in the age of Instagram and Facebook and TikTok and people are constantly, you know, taking pictures or videos of themselves. Um, it turns out they're not really good at taking pictures for that are clinically useful. And so what happened is at least in Stanford Durham, when everybody was doing telemedicine, we realized we were getting so many poor quality images that the residents were asked to manually review all the images um, prior to the clinical visit. And um, to this day, a lot of manual review is involved still with the images that are sent in. And, and we are sent a large volume of images, even outside of just the telemedicine visits, also patients asking questions um, for research, you know, images are taken for research projects as Dr. Linos and Dr. Tang mentioned. Um, and this manual review of image quality uh, consumes thousands of hours of time it's very disruptive to either the research project or the clinical workflow. Um, and so, and also these poor quality images actually further impede the development of AI technologies that we want, want to make down the line to be able to help with, for example, um, disease monitoring or triage. And so what our team asked is what if we could make taking the images of skin disease as easy as taking an image of a check. Like when you do online deposit, you take an image of the check, you, you know, it kind of tells you move it up and down, it's too blurry, it's too dark, it gives you, you know, real time feedback. Whereas right now, the way that it works is you send an image, somebody looks at it and says, oh, it's too dark, and then, you know, responds to you. And that whole loop takes a lot of time. Um, and so the whole idea is that at the point of image capture, we would be able to tell the patient, hey, actually this image is inadequate. Like this is what you need to do to take a better image. And then it would give them sort of a green light to be able to submit that image. And so the way that we decided to do this is to leverage AI because essentially what we care about in clinical images is maybe not what you care about the most for your most beautiful like Instagram photo. What you care about for your clinical images is you don't actually care if the background is blurry. You just care if the lesion and the area that's affected is in focus and everything else matters a lot less, right? So we actually took for our training data, 1700 images from past clinical and teledermatology encounters and we labeled them according to the ability to make a clinical judgment from the image. So is it a perfect photo for making a clinical assessment? That doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, like I said, the background could be blurry. We don't care. We want to know, is the lesion or the area of interest look good? And so um, we had clinicians label their assessment of these images. And then if the image wasn't good enough quality, we asked them to tell us why. So we also asked them to label it with why. Is it a lighting issue? Is it a blurriness issue? Which these are the two most common cases. And the third being, you know, zoom crop issues. 
And when we took all that data and we basically built a AI model that leveraged deep learning and classical learning algorithms, and then was able to give an output, whether the image was a good quality image or a bad quality image. And if it's a bad quality image, what is actually wrong with the photo? And we tested this retrospectively on um, data that we had from other telemedicine images and found that on average, depending on where we put our operating point, we could basically identify about 80% of the poor quality images while keeping 80% of the best quality images. So there's always some false positive, true positive trade-offs that you have to make. And for us, we thought if we can reduce the poor quality images by 80%, that's okay if we ask some percentage of patients who had a good quality image initially to have to retake the photo. The other thing we looked at is whether our algorithm performed well across different demographic groups, um, such as looking at skin tone, um, which is very important because previous work that I've done that I'm not gonna discuss today has shown that AI algorithms often um, leave out uh, diverse skin tones in their training and then subsequently perform significantly worse on uh, diverse skin tones compared to just white skin. Um, we show that it performs uh, statistically similarly across age and across um, gender. So we were pretty happy with our retrospective data results. And I, you know, there are many AI algorithms that people have developed and they've demonstrated something on retrospective data and they've published a nice paper. And we also published a nice paper, but that's not really useful to the real world. Um, and so what we decided to do next is actually test the algorithm in the real world with real patients. And so um, we basically developed this very um, basic uh, user interface and we got a setup where we could run our algorithm in real time in on a phone that we could give to patients that we recruited in clinic and that those patients could be asked to take images in clinic which is not which is not you know exactly the same as being at home but it's a close proxy and the algorithm would basically give them feedback on whether or not it was a good image and actually, the most interesting part of this is that patients had the opportunity before they hit submit and get feedback from the algorithm to retake the photo. So in order to decide, to, in order to get feedback from the algorithm, the patient had to take the photo, look at the photo, say, oh yeah, that's a photo I would send in, and then hit submit. Um, and then they would get real-time feedback and told like, you need to take it again, or that's an acceptable photo to send to the team. And when we did this, we we were ended up recruiting uh, 98 patients from two different sites. We had images that were like their baseline image, the image that they wanted to submit, and then the images that were subsequently um, taken based on whether or not true image told them they needed to retake. So if their image was perfect the first time, you know, that's their baseline. There's no repeat for them, but, you know, we found that essentially about 40% of patients, which is consistent with what's been seen in the uh, previously published literature in JAMA Dermatology, about 40% of patients do not take adequate clinical images uh, for telemedicine. And then we collected all the images that were taken in this trial and we gave it to clinicians. The clinicians were blinded to whether the images were the baseline image or an image that was taken um, after true image feedback. Um, so they had no idea what true image said about the images, but then they rated those images as to whether or not they were clinically usable. And what we found is sort of using this A, B, C, D, F scale, we had actually no F images in our trial, but we had plenty of C and D images which are images that are essentially not usable. What we found is that after true image use, the subsequent uh, images taken with the real-time AI feedback led to a statistically significant improvement in the image quality. 
anywhere from a C becoming closer to a B and then the D going up about 1.75 points on average, meaning that it was also closer to a B image. So what does that look like? That essentially looks like going from an image that is completely blurry, unable to figure out what's going on to an image that's much crisper, allows you to be able to see exactly what's going on and that these lesions are just, you know, benign moles, nothing to worry about. And so um, we were really encouraged with seeing uh, the algorithm not only working on the retrospective data, but that the AI human interaction piece, because that's key, was actually leading to improved images. Because many times in the field of AI, you have these algorithms that work well in retrospective data, but then when you add the human element of that interaction of the human and the algorithm, you don't always necessarily lead to that subsequent improvement. So we have had funding from the Catalyst program at Stanford. And with the Catalyst program, we have now actually designed a very beautiful UI. And we basically have uh, built the infrastructure around deploying this algorithm. It's currently, we have sort of our own app that we've created that connects with Epic. And so our next round of trials are actually starting this week where we're going to have patients who are at home go into the True Image app and be able to take photos and send photos in. And those photos are gonna end up in the in basket of the clinicians who were the clinicians that they saw. Um, and we're gonna essentially assess the patient experience and the physician's experience with whether or not they also continue to get better quality photos. Um, and so with that, I would like to thank our Catalyst funding, um, which was so critical. And this is the team that we worked with to develop this, to clinically test it, and for the next round of sort of additional clinical testing. Thank you, that was fantastic. Check the chat. <clears throat> no questions in the chat. So I can start. Um, and I guess, could we do anybody? Um, of all the different kinds of lesions that you can see in dermatology, which ones do you think are the most challenging for for sort of digital imaging? Uh, is it the, the, the pigments, the wounds, the, sh the shiny ones, the pink ones? I don't know. I don't know if um, Gina and Roxana agree, but um, for me, some of the most challenging ones are the are the sorry skin lesions that occur in locations that you don't you know that isn't flat skin. So seeing um, seeing a photo uh, where you're not really sure of the angles is tricky, and we have some ways to deal with that by. I know Jean has been placing stickers and a round sticker you can tell based on whether it looks oval or flat in the photo, um, what the, the kind of contours of the skin are. Um, but I think one of the, the other things to, to, you know, taking a step back from your questions is it's not the skin lesion itself that's a challenge. Sometimes it's the lack of history or, you know, knowing the story or the background, having the information. So the photo alone only gives you part of the story. But the actual story, you know, what happened? How did this happen? When did it start? Is it itchy? You know, um, has it happened before? The history is really, really important. So one of the things we're realizing that is that, you know, if you don't know the diagnosis ahead of time, mm -hmm. um, having the history to go with the image is, is really crucial. Um, Jean, I don't know, or Roxana, if you want to add anything to that. I think actually one big issue too is um, with diverse skin tones. And um, there was a publication that Dr. Jenna Lester led and Eleni was also involved with where we looked at, because a lot of the guidelines for how to take good photography um, has been centered on white skin. And so um, like, for example, using flash, you get flash artifact. Um, the other thing is that, um, a lot of these al internal algorithms to these phone cameras around color balancing have been historically very biased 
mm. uh, around having good representation um, and will change the colors in ways that is maybe not desirable. And there's no real, like if you look at different cameras and how the same skin tone appears, you'll, you'll notice that brown and black skin can look very different between cameras in the same exact lighting condition. And so I think that's like a one big challenge too with, with images. And I see a lot of images that have like flash, uh, you know, flash artifacts in them. Um, and so just trying to, which is why it was very important for us when we were developing our automatic feedback algorithm to make sure that we had the representation of diverse skin tones so that we knew what a good image looked like across all skin tones. Fascinating stuff you would have never guessed. Uh, let's see. Uh, we have a question in the chat uh, from Jessica Lee. Is traveling to visits difficult for EB patients because of the additional movement required um, or something specific to being on a plane? I think it's all the additional movement. You know, it's, um, you know, sitting for a long time, I imagine, you know, moving from car to another car. And, you know, we always pay in our clinical trials uh, for a caregiver to travel with them. You know, many of them, the severe ones don't even have, you know, separate digits. They have, you know, um, scarred um, pseudosyndactyly or, you know, mitten hand deformity. You know, they can't lift their luggage and, um, you know, some of them may have problems with eating and feeding, right? And so um, even when Nikki and, you know, Kylie in the past um, uh, booked travel and hotel, these patients often need um, a hotel room with a bath because um, with their dr dressings and bandages, if there's um, dried serosanguinous fluid, dried blood on it, can you imagine taking off this kind of uh, woolly, um, you know, um, bandage? It's, it's crusted on, it's painful, it may rip additional skin. And so they need to be submerged, not all of them, many of them need to be submerged in a bathtub so the dressings are loose and they come off more easily. So you can imagine for somebody as fragile with a lot of um, just used to their own uh, system of wound cleansing and bathing and, you know, they're used to being in their own homes and they usually don't travel very hard. So it is a very, very big ask. And when you think of, especially in MCHRI, I know a lot of you do, are doing really exciting, you know, gene therapy trials and sickle cell anemia and, you know, other immune uh, diseases. You know, as scientists, we always think, my goodness, you know, targeted therapy, you know, what patient wouldn't want this, right? And so in focus group discussions um, and qualitative research that we're doing with Eleni, you know, it's not just the science, it's all these other humanistic factors that are so important, right? To whether um, a patient in a family with a rare debilitating disease signs up for a clinical trial. And, um, you know, clinical trial enrollment is very slow, especially for pediatric patients. What can we learn from these listening sessions um, so we can understand um, their hesitations that are very valid, especially among underrepresented minorities? What are their hesitations towards genetic research, towards uh, clinical trials, you know, um, with gene therapy? I think this is a new field that we all have a lot to learn from. Lorraine is somebody who is a wonderful, wonderful EB um, clinic coordinator. She has a patient, she has a son uh, with EB and uh, she's just saying that, you know, bathroom needs are a huge deal. A lot of these patients, you know, have scarring, um, you know, rectal scarring and uh, just going to the bathroom is a huge challenge and going to a bathroom that's not inside your home, you know, it's a big, big deal. Thank you. <clears throat> well, there's, let's see. Yeah. Um, so I, I, you know, I can keep asking questions forever. I guess we have till one, but um. <laughs> I just want to say, if, you know, anybody's interested in our research or interested in collaborations or have additional um, 
questions, please reach out to us individually. You know, our CUNETs are available and, you know, we're always looking for good postdocs and good collaborators too. So just wanted to plug, put in a plug for our research groups. Thank you. I'll just do one last question. Um, um, so it seems like, you know, we always talk about like with data collection, standardization, standardization, but with this kind right. of approach, you kind of want to, you want to be able to collect from anybody almost like, um, how do you, how would you standardize when you're asking everyone with any phone to collect an image for you? Is that just like not even a question here? Or if no, you could imagine standard, a perfect situation, what would you do? Yeah, we do standardized intervals, right? Weekly mm -hmm. intervals, give or take but, one day. But uh, what about like the actual time. image collection? Is there a way to like, would it be like a certain magic sticker that all of a sudden makes the picture perfect? Like in some perfect world, is, is there a way to standardize or is just, should we just try to develop tools that don't need that? So I think it's always a balance between, you know, it's not a radiology image or a pathology image that's, you know, standardized no matter what, where it's an x-ray and it's, you know, the, the patient doesn't move. Um, but we do try to give some guidance if the patients um, have not been uh, consistently submitting high quality images. So in terms of lighting, in terms of distance, mm -hmm. uh, we've also found that submitting multiple photos or having someone help them with the photo can be really helpful. I think the sticker and the ruler are essential if you want to monitor change in size. Um, so yes, the, you know, there are guidelines, but what's interesting is that, you know, people who are familiar with taking photos with their cell phone now are so good. So even though initially dermatologists traditionally were very fixated on giving people instructions, what we found practically is that actually the vast majority of photos are, are of high quality. This, what you say about standardizing the angle can matter. So, um, so that, you know, again, for depending on the surface and the distance, so that can be helpful to, um, uh, to give patients guidance on. But in general, you know, I've definitely been surprised at how good the quality is, but then it makes sense because people are used to using their, their cameras routinely. Um, yeah, Roxana, do you want to add? Yeah, we actually had the opposite experience because we actually looked at retrospective of Stanford data. So maybe it's just that the people who are in your trial are more motivated because looking at retrospective teledermatology images, about 48% of the images had poor quality um, image scores. Prospectively, same percentage. Externally published in JAMA Derm, same percentage. Like it's actually pretty impressive how consistent it was. Mm -hmm. in terms of, um, you know, but of course you guys are looking also at different disease. We are looking also at lesions as well. So, uh, we get a lot of very like unusable photos of lesions. So, um, yeah, so I think, I think, I think it, disease matters, but also like, we're looking at like all comers in terms of like the retrospective data so that could also be a difference in the population. We have one last set of questions in the um, chat. Aurea, can you unmute and ask them or do I have to do it for you? I, I can unmute. Awesome. Um, okay, one of my questions is, is the app, if the app can be used to make a differential diagnosis, if you, if they start sending you pictures, and I don't know if you can fill the history, if the patient can fill the history and pictures, can they make a, uh, a, can you make the differential diagnosis or it needs to be seen by a dermatologist first, and then the app will guide them how to take the pictures and how they are doing, uh, how is the progress of the disease, or if they are responding to the treatment. And um, my other question is, um, uh, uh, well, that's one of my main questions. And then I, I have a background in um, veterinary dermatology. And if you, what kind of um, uh, animal models are you using to, uh, to help uh, the humans and how we can use the the things that you're doing in the in the animals that is one of my 
the things that it would be great for me. Well, that's fascinating, Aria, and I'd love to talk to you more about collaborations because I, I think that would be so interesting to do veterinary dermatology um, disease monitoring. How how um, interesting would that be? But to briefly answer our, what we're developing is not a diagnostic tool. It's once the diagnosis has already been made to monitor the skin disease trajectory and the changes over time. So um, we're not trying to make the diagnosis initially from, from the photo, but uh, Roxanne, I don't know if you wanna add about how True Image is, is used for diagnosis. True Image doesn't do diagnosis. It just looks at image quality because diagnostics um, technically should require clearance from the FDA, be using an AI algorithm with diagnostics unless you're in the research phase. We have worked, we are working on triage diagnostics very early stage, would require lots of clinical trials to validate. And even then we're not trying to diagnose, we're just trying to triage uh, acuity of cases. So um, there's a lot of people in the industry working on diagnostics and direct to consumer diagnostics. Nobody has FDA approval on any of those things. There are some that have CE mark, we've actually, done research about significant bias, skin tone bias um, that likely exists in those because almost the majority of them have only trained their AI algorithms on disease in white skin. So it's a huge, huge problem. Well, thank you everyone. That was a fantastic seminar. Um, and thank you everyone else for your participation. And we'll see you on May 2nd. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. 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 Bye.